we are taking time to worship God and we've come to the time of the message to keep uh, Dwayne and his family in prayer. His sister went home to be with the Lord yesterday and uh, be in prayer for her husband, Robert, that's Holker's family. They know the Lord, but this is a tough time. It's a tough time. I believe they've been married 42, 43 years probably. And we're making plans, like so many of us. You know, what are you going to do when you get to be old and crotchety? You're going to retire somewhere. And so uh, uh, Dwayne was sharing with me that their, their dream was to retire up into Medford, Oregon. And that was probably a year or so away. Beautiful country. But, uh, you know, God has other plans. And we trust God in his plans. He's a good God. He's a good God. Always remember that. Always remember that. Take your Bibles. We're going to continue our study in the book of Colossians. Book of Colossians. Book of Colossians. <clears throat> Keep thinking that one of these days I'll reach back in there and find a nice cool chocolate milk, but I don't think so. What? No, no, it's not a hint. No, not a hint. I like chocolate milk and all that, but I'm doing this diet thing, and I'm staying to it, I'll tell you. Yes, right. I'll tell you. It's tough. It's tough. Book of Colossians. It's, today, we're going to talk about the deity of Jesus. What am I saying? Well, I'm simply saying Jesus is God. Jesus is God. You realize how many religions there are that do not believe that Jesus is God? There's so many. There's so many. And, and I want you to take notes today. Because you go, oh, I know that Jesus is God. But you need to put down some scripture. You need to put down some definitions. You need to record some of these things so that you can be able to regurgitate it to someone if you need to. It's, it's more to just being a witness and testimony and saying that Jesus is God. I'm telling you that Jesus is God. Well, what's your proof? Well, we have scripture here. And so I want to go through some scripture. And I want to then also give you some definitions, some words and definitions. I think it's a great way to study the Bible, to look into what the words mean. And uh, so that you can be able to tell someone, remember it. When you're witnessing, you're telling people God's words. This is what the word of God says. Um, there are so many people, and I'll tell you what, uh, Alice and I have been looking into some things and studying some things, and, uh, and it's, it's amazing that how that people always seem they want to come uh, up with some hidden truth of God's word. And it's good to study God's word, but you know what? Jesus said, come, have him come to me like a little child. Come to me like a little child in simplicity. You don't have to understand everything. Just understand what he's trying to tell you. But I think sometimes people try to dig so deep that that's when you start getting these different philosophies, not theology, as we we're talking about, gets intermingled into God's word. So let's stick to God's word this morning. The Bible says in, first, uh, it's in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 17, who is the image of the invisible God, talking about Christ, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him, and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Let's pray. God, I pray that you would speak to us this morning through your word. May your Holy Spirit be able to move freely. We thank you so much for your presence here with us today through your Holy Spirit. God, I pray that as we've come here today that we are showing you reverence and giving you the honor and the glory that you are due. I pray, God, that as we sang, that we were singing praises to you and not just repeating words. God, may we just take opportunity, every opportunity, to praise you, that everything that hath breath praise you. 
God, help us now today. Help us to learn your word. Help us to become the disciples that you intended for us to be. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Paul's moving from uh, into the main focus of this epistle right now, and that has to do with the exaltation and the preeminence of Christ in his person and in his work. Jesus Christ is exalted. He's the sovereign Christ. He's the supreme Christ. He is the one who is Lord of all. I'm here to tell you today that Christianity, what we're talking about, is not a religion. It's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. There's a difference. A lot of people have religions. Religions. I'm here to tell you today, I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And I pray that you do as well. If you've received Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, if you have been saved, you experienced the new birth, then you do have the beginnings of that personal relationship with him. But I'm here also to tell you there's so much more to that relationship. But we have to get into his word to understand that. Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship with the person of Jesus Christ. Acts 4, chapter 4 and verse 12 tells us this. It says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven among, given among men whereby we must be saved. This Jesus Christ is so important so important to us today. Jesus Christ is totally unique from every other human being who has ever existed or who will ever exist. He was God, man, God, man. Talk about that a little bit tonight, that he was God, man. I believe that's in my notes tonight. I get my messages mixed up. Without truly understanding who Jesus really is and what he alone accomplished through the cross, understand this, listen to this, people become prime targets, prime targets for false teaching, for false teaching. So it's necessary to understand who Jesus Christ is. The verses 15 through 18, some have called the great Christology because it Paul sets forth in his inspired writing here that uh, who Jesus Christ truly is. So verse 15, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. The word for image, the Greek word is ekion, E-I-K-O-N, I can't know how to pronounce it, maybe Don can pronounce it, I don't. But it means that which resembles an object or which represents it. So the definition of image is that which resembles an object which represents it. That which resembles an object which, re which represents it. Jesus is stressing that, I mean Paul is stressing that Jesus is the perfect manifestation of God. But we need to understand what image is really saying here, okay? Because uh, how many know what the word etymology is? Means I'm going to give you a definition. Etymology, etymology. It has to do with an origin of a word, the origin of the word, and its historical development through history of its meaning, okay? Origin of word. I have to write these things down, Alice. Now Alice can go, oh, that means this. I can tell you numbers, but she can tell you words. Okay, etymology. So, <clears throat> the theology is correct that uh, Jesus is the perfect manifestation. But that's, it, image here is saying likeness, likeness. Now, don't lose me, don't lose me. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 7 says, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image, he is the image and glory of God, but the wo woman is the glory of man. To say that this word image in this verse, which is the same word in 1 Corinthians 11, 7, image, would be saying that we're just like God. Well, I'm not just like God. I'm not just like God. In Genesis 1, 26, 
We're made in the image of God. Made in the image of God. Does it mean a perfect manifestation? Manifestation. Jesus Christ, though, is the perfect manifestation of God. So while this says that his, his, his image, we learn from other scriptures that Jesus Christ is the perfect manifestation of God. Okay? Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. If you want to turn there, go ahead. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. The Bible says, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, who being the brightness of his glory, the word brightness, the word brightness means to send forth light, to send forth light. Who is that light? Jesus Christ. Jesus is the manifestation of God. By way of comparison, we can say that Christ is the radiant light coming from the Father, just as we sunlight emanates from the sun. Okay? Remember, our text says that Jesus is the image. He's the image of the invisible God. See, God is invisible. He's got the spirit. No one has seen God. The Bible tells us that. No one has seen God. But Jesus Christ is always the visible member of the Trinity. He's always the visible member of the Trinity. Turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah 6, we'll begin in verse 1. Verse 1, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting up on a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Well, now, who was that? Who was that? Talk to me. It was Jesus Christ. It was Christ. It wasn't God. No man has seen God. God is a spirit. Above it stood the seraphims. Each had <clears throat> six wings, and twain, with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy. Now, listen, look at the word, cried. They were shouting this, Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of glo his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. That's what Isaiah is saying. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs, the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed. But understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert, and be healed. Who was it that Isaiah saw? Do you answer the question? Who was it? It was, it was Christ. It was Christ. The member of the Trinity. How do we know this? Turn in your Bibles to the book of John. Turn in the book of John, chapter 12. Verse 
Chapter 12, verses 36 through 41. I'm going to try to read it from my notes, so if I read it incorrectly, I typed it wrong. It says, While you have light, you believe, believe in the light, that ye may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus, and departed, and did hide himself from them. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. That the saying of Isaiah, who's Isaiah? It's Isaiah. He's talking about Isaiah. That the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw the glory and spake of him. You see what we're doing? You recognize what we're doing? We're taking scripture, proving scripture, just reinforcing scripture, reinforcing scripture. Jesus is God, you'll tell your friends. How can you prove it? How can you prove it? You take them to Isaiah. You take them back to John. John tells us that Isaiah saw Jesus Christ, the brightness of God's essence manifested to men. Look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 6. Philippians chapter 2, verse 6. The deity of Jesus says, Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Great scripture. Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now let's define the word being. B-E-I-N-G. -E -E it's a verb. It is to express the continued state of a thing. Being. It expresses the continued state of a thing. You cannot change it. It's unalterable. Paul said Jesus Christ exists in the form of God. Jesus Christ exists. This, now when you understand this, this speaks of Jesus Christ's pre-existence. He's always been. He's always been. Look at the word form. It comes from the word morph. It has nothing to do with shape or size in this instance. In John 4, 24, the Bible tells us, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You know, if you get together with a bunch of people and you start worshiping, and this is kind of talking, we've been talking about things, we used to call it ecumenical movement, where everybody gets together, a whole bunch of different religions, and everybody starts worshiping, and they, but I believe a little bit different here, and I believe a little bit different here. You know what? If you, don't, if you don't worship in truth, you're not worshiping. You're not worshiping. Luke chapter 24, verse 39 says, Behold my hands and my, my, hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me have. So morph refers to the essence or the essential being. Jesus Christ, pre-existent, pre-existed. Jesus Christ is eternal God. He's part of the Trinity. Part of the Trinity. He's always existed. He's co-equal. He's co-eternal with God. You know, we talked, uh, talked a little bit earlier about uh, we want to be able to explain everything. Got to understand everything. Uh, that's just the nature of man. We've got to understand everything. If I can't explain it, I'll figure out some way to explain it. That's kind of how I joke and say that when I read a word in the Bible or a name in the Bible, and I'll say however I say it is true. I know it's not. But it's just kind of a joke. But it's just kind of in us that we want to be right. We want to be right. <clears throat> John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Who's the word? Jesus. 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 
How do we know that? Drop down to verse 14. And the word was made flesh, talking about Jesus Christ, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Oh, I'm so thankful that my Jesus is full of grace. Full of grace. And I praise God for his truth. There's no doubt as to who the word is. It's Jesus Christ. But see what we're doing? It's more than just saying Jesus is God. How do you know? That's why we're taking some scripture. We're making notes. John chapter 8, verse 58. Not only was he, but he claimed to be God. Look at John 8, 58. The Bible says, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. That's a great scripture. Before Abraham was, I am. He's talking to all these religious people. Oh, they knew exactly. They knew exactly what he was claiming. He was claiming to be God. That's why they took up stones and they wanted to stone him because he was claiming to be God. Jesus is claiming to be I am. To be God himself who was revealed as the I am that I am. I am is a transliteration of the personal name of God in Hebrew, by the way. I am. I am. Jesus Christ claimed an existence that was timeless. And they understood what he was saying. And verse 59 says, Then they took up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. What I'm saying? I'm saying that Jesus Christ is the manifestation of the invisible God. When they saw Jesus, they saw God. Paul goes on also to say that he is the firstborn of every creature. Now watch out, because some people get confused here. The firstborn. Oh, well then he was created. And, And that causes a debate with some people. But it goes on to say, the next verse says, For by him were all things created. For by him were all things created. One cannot create himself. Okay? Jesus Christ is God. There are things in this Bible that we cannot explain. And it just, I told Alice this morning. Because I look at all these very intelligent people, and they are. And they try to dig out these nuggets of truth from God's word. And praise God, if you're staying with scripture and not building upon supposition that you've come up with yourself, good for you. But when they start digging in here and they have to change it, that's where the problem comes in. And some people get confused by this. But understand this, that one cannot create himself. Jesus, the firstborn, is explained in that everything came into existence in him in verse 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven. This is talking about Jesus. Uh, In uh, heaven, and uh, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And for him. The firstborn is not suggesting Christ as having been created. It's proclaiming his divinity. His pre-existence, his sovereignty. The word firstborn has nothing to do with the birth of Christ. Nothing to do with the birth of Christ. You know, the Bible doesn't teach that Jesus began at Bethlehem. That's where he was born in the flesh, right? But it doesn't say that's where Jesus began. The Bible teaches that he was from everlasting. He's from everlasting. Micah chapter 5 and verse 2 says, But thou, Bethlehem Epaphra, 
Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, uh, that is to be ruler of Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. From everlasting. So much of the time we read scripture and we just miss some of the phrases. Again, we were talking about a particular scripture this morning and how that a lot of people will major on the first 80% of the scripture and then they drop off that last 20% uh, which would change everything about how they believed if they would just let it speak to them. So Jesus Christ is the manifestation of the invisible God. Colossians chapter 1 verse 16 I just read. Another distinctive of the glory of Christ is that he created all things. All things were created they were designed by him, for him, in him, is preserved by him. Not only did he create all things, but guess what? All things continue, all things continue to subsist because of him. You realize that he keeps it all in motion? He keeps it going? It's Jesus. We think that we're something. I mean, in America, we live in prosperity and we have the greatest nation in the world. And, and, and we tend to think that, look what I've done. Look what I've done. Uh, we've not done anything less Jesus allows us to or continues. It says, for by him were all things created. The word for, the word for, points to the, it points the reader to the reason why Christ is sovereign over all creation. By him were all things created. All things, it's mentioned six times in verses 15 through 18. All things, they were created by him. By him. Visible and invisible. Christ is the author. He's the means and the end of creation. All comes from him, all lives by him, all ends in him. That's one person said. You know, if we understand this, it would really help us when it comes to time of being panicked and worried to understand that Jesus Christ is in control. Jesus is in control of the heart that's beating within me. He's in control of the heart that's beating within you. Jesus is in control of what's going on. He has not lost control. We think that the world is falling down around us. God is in control. God is in control. In verse 17 he says, And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. All things consist. Back to John 1 1, the Son of God existed before the creation of the world. He lived before the beginning of time from all eternity. Explain that one, intelligent person. Explain that one. I used to have a friend that looked at me, he called me Thomason. We called each other by our last names. We knew each other's first names, but it was just a thing back then. He said, Thomason, I want to let you know that one of my thoughts would burst your head wide open. Kind of a funny ha-ha. And maybe it would have. I don't know. But explain that away. How has God been here forever? How do you, how do you explain that? Explain the Trinity. I, I don't know. I don't know. There's some things we can't explain. But by him, all things consist. That means consist means to hold together, to stand together. To be compacted together, to cohere, cohere, to be constituted with. And this word describes that they were held together from one point in time and they remain held together. The word consists. How do you get all that out of there? You go into the dictionary and you start looking things up. This is what it's talking about. God's holding it all together. Can you imagine what would happen if Jesus Christ said, I'm going to take the day off? Now, 
he's in eternity, so I don't think he deals in days. Okay. But what would happen? What would happen? They tell me that the surface of the sun, anybody have an idea how many degrees it is, the surface of a sun? 12,000 degrees. Now, I don't know when, uh, who, who went up there and took the temperature. Maybe they went at night. But, that's another joke, that's an old joke. But think about it. If the sun were any closer to the earth, we'd burn up. If it was any further away, we'd be in that ice age that they were telling me about when I was growing up. If the moon did not remain a specific distance from the earth, do you know that two times a day the, all the land would be covered in water? You know, whether we're told we're told that we're in a global warming type of situation. And if you want to know how much of a skeptic I am, you can come talk to me later. But, you know, they talk about the, the, the oceans are going to rise and this and that. No, it's not. Why? Because my God, Jesus, is in control. Don't believe the lie. Don't believe the lie. We are all dependent upon Christ for existence. In Daniel chapter 5, 23, Daniel was God, God speaking, uh, Daniel was speaking, and God was saying to Belshazzar, and the God in whose hand thy breath is and whose are all thy ways, that's where we are today. My breath is in his hand. My Jesus, he's in control. You know, there are many scientists today that acknowledge that God exists, but he only exists as a first cause. We talked about this, first cause. They're talking about that, he, that Jesus created it all, but then he just kind of let it go and let it evolve. And they're saying that he was not involved in creation after the, he created it. This is called deism. Deism. That's a word you can put down. Deism. D-E-I-S-M. It's liberal theology. Again, why, why is that? It's just man trying to explain dinosaurs, this, that, and the other thing. We're literalists. We believe God's word. I believe God's word, what it says. It's contrary to what the Bible says, and yet they have got to find a way to explain it. It's contrary to the statements of God. Remember, God worketh, worketh. He worketh. He energizes all things after the counsel of his own will, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. And when I think about Christ's power and his ability to hold everything and control everything, it causes me to think of Romans chapter 8 and verse 28 where it says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. All things are working together. All things. So why should I despair? Why do I hang on to fear? If God can hold all of this world together, if he can place that sun just where it needs to be and cause that moon to move as it needs to, how hard is it to take care of me? How difficult is it? He sustains the universe. Certainly, he can control any problem that I have, Robert. Any problem. If he can keep the stars from colliding, my goodness, we throw stuff up in space, satellites and what have you, and there must be thousands of these satellites up in space. Well, guess what? Whenever we shoot something else up, you know what they have to do? They have to say, well, we can't put it in that orbit. We've got to move it over here. Why? Because that's going to come by and just slam into it and break it up. 
And yet God created the heavens and the universe, all the countless constellations and the stars, and he set them in a fashion they don't collide with one another. He can take care of us. Jesus Christ is God. Folks, Jesus Christ is God. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Just a couple of minutes here. We talked about Jesus Christ is God. Jesus, the deity of Christ. I wanted to give you some things so that you can have with you, so that you can be an effective witness. Where do we go from here? What's your worry this morning? What is your concern this morning? We look at our economy. We look at this, what they call the pandemic. Are you concerned that you'll have a job next month? Have you been told that the, there might be a layoff? What about your health? You know, I get older and I'm cognizant and aware that uh, it wouldn't be uncommon for me or some one of us in here to be diagnosed with a disease. We have a friend of ours that's a little younger than us, been diagnosed with a rare kind of cancer. He's been given six months to two years to live. Understand this, that nothing can happen to you outside the will of God. God is in control. We have got to trust him. We have got to trust him. He's in control. He's the creator, and he's the sustainer of the entire universe, and he's in control of that, and he's in control of our lives. I'm going to have a word of prayer. If you have a need this morning, something that God is speaking to you about, Whatever it is, the altar will be open. We'll sing a couple of verses, and I'd ask you to access it and use it. Jesus, I pray that you'd have your will and way in our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.